Sri Barga Guru Beer Atmane Upa Sik Sitam Natsaru Mena Chach Chiksam Dwandwaram Mo Pavarnitam Yata Sri Barga Guru Beer Mane upa six sitam Nasado Nasado mene touch chicksum Dwan Dwan vara mo pavarnitam Yata tree bargo guru beer At Mane upa six sitam Asaru mena mene touch chicksum. Asaru mene touch chicksum. Dwanvaro mo parvarnitam. Sri Bargam, the 
three processes. Religion, economic development, and sense gratification. <coughs> Guvi, by the teachers. Atmane, unto himself. Prahlad Maharaj. Vishik Sitam, instructed. Na, na, sadhu. Really good. Mene, he considered. Six sum. The education in that. Dwanva Arama. By persons taking pleasure in duality. In material enmity and friendship. Upavarnitam. Which is prescribed. Translation. <coughs> The teachers, Sunda and Amarka, instructed Prahlad Maharaj in the three kinds of material advancement called religion, economic development, and sense gratification. Prahlad, however, being situated above such instructions, did not like them, for such instructions are based on the duality of worldly affairs, which involve one in the materialist way of life, materialistic way of life, marked by birth, death, old age, and disease. <clears throat> the entire world is interested in the materialistic way of life. <clears throat> Indeed, practically 99.9% .9 of the population in the three worlds are uninterested in liberation or spiritual education. Only the devotees of the Lord headed by such great personalities as Prahlad Maharaj and Narada Muni are interested in real education of spiritual life. One cannot understand the principle of religion while staying on the material platform. One cannot understand the principles of religion while staying on the material platform. That's, a, that's something to meditate on. Okay. Therefore, one must follow these great personalities as stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 6.3.20 Svayambur Narada Sambhu Kumara Kupila Mano Pralado Janago Vishmo Balir Vaya Sikir Vayam One must follow in the footsteps of such great personalities as Lord Brahma, Narada, Lord Shiva, Kapila, Manu, the Kumaras, Pralada Maharaj, Bhishma, Janaka, Bali Maharaj, Sukadeva Goswami, and Yamaraj. Those interested in spiritual life should follow Prahlad Maharaj in rejecting the education of religion, economic development, and sense gratification. One should be interested in spiritual education. Therefore, the Krishna conscious movement is spreading all over the world, following in the footsteps of Prahlad Maharaj, who did not like any of the materialistic education he received from his teachers. He didn't like any of it. Omegyan timiram dasya gira jala silakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri guru vena maha shri chaitanya manobis tam stapti tam yena bhutale svayam rupa kadam mayam dadati svam padati kam Maum Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prastaya Bhutale, Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine, Namaste, Saraswati Devi Gauravani, Pacharine, Nirvishesa Sunyavadi, Vastyati De Satarine, Pancha Kalpa, Taru Vischa, Kripa, Sindhu, Pae Pacha, Patita Nam, Pavane Bio, Vaishnave Bio, Namaho Namaha, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. So being instructed here about the different the, the clear distinction between two types of education. Actually, there's only really one type of education. We sometimes we say materialistic education. But actually, as Prabhupada describes, material education is more like learning how to somehow or other keep the body and mind together, uh, which is really not necessary for material education because 
there are persons like, you know, great saints and sunny sages who live in the forest who can't even write their name, but they don't have any problems maintaining their body and mind. Uh, sometimes we also define materialistic education as a coat of paint upon the surface. In other words, education comes from the Latin word educare, which means to bring out. And so the actual etymological meaning of the word education means to bring out something that is already within you. Material education is just teaching you, or not teaching you, but giving you information, that's all. It's more like getting information about the things of the body and things of this world. But education is actually something which is the feature of the, the soul. Which is, what is that education? Is that the soul is completely aware of its position in relationship to everything, especially into the Supreme Soul, which is the source of its existence. So that's a vast level of education. But we don't have to learn that, because we already know it. Spiritual education is there within the heart and mind, in the heart of the living entity automatically. So the process of learning is the process of awakening or bringing out that education through the process of bhakti. But we learn things from the scriptures taught by great sages and saints, and by great acharyas and te spiritual teachers, and by examples from other persons who have real, real realizations in their practice of spiritual life. So those forms of knowledge actually inspire us and uh, what we say, help us to awaken our real knowledge of Krishna, which is there within the soul. So there's no need. I hear Prahlad Maharaj, he's only five years old. Where did he get his education from? He heard from his spiritual master, Narada Muni. So this is actually uh, the principle of education. Therefore, the, the word Veda actually means knowledge. When Prabhupada was challenged in a question and answer session by people who wanted to know more, uh, these are people who are academic initiates and scholars, and they said they had did some research and that the Vedas are only like 2,000 years old or 1,000 so many years old. And Prabhupada immediately went to this, he said, Veda means knowledge and knowledge means eternal. <laughs> so you can't trace out the beginning of knowledge, therefore the word Veda actually means beginning of all the, all the knowledge that is coming originally from the source of knowledge, Sri Krishna himself. So, the, yeah, so therefore the word Veda really means knowledge, and well, how is that knowledge given? It's given by Shruti. So another name for the Vedas is the Shruti. That's another synonym for the word Veda, is to hear. <laughs> and the word Upanishad means sit down near. So sit down near means to sit down near a person who has knowledge and learn from that person. So that's how knowledge was given, through the process of hearing from one who has that knowledge or self-realized souls. And that makes up the essence of the how knowledge is communicated. But knowledge itself is situated in the heart, therefore the principle of the soul is chit. Chit means full knowledge. So that's the only knowledge that's really required in order to, what we say, to achieve self-realization. And the materialistic knowledge, when we have Gorkishore does Babaji Maharaj, he couldn't even write his name. But who was his disciple? Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj, who was one of the greatest scholars and proponents of you know, spiritual knowledge. But his guru, was illiterate in terms of, you know, he couldn't even write his name, as we hear from, you know, from the Shastras. But what was his qualification? He was self-realized. So sometimes devotees think we need a certain amount of materialistic knowledge. Just like I know there's one particular temple that uh, 
when devotees join, if they're going to college or going to university, uh, the leaders in the temple say, finish your university education, and then you come and join the ashram. And then once you join the ashram for the first year, you know, you, uh, you can also do some of the, your employment. Uh, and that way you can pay back your parents because it's, you know, they gave you all the money for the education. But the whole thing came, comes right down to when I asked the devotee, you know, why do you, what is the benefit of materialistic ed education? And he said one thing, it, it helps you become regulated. In other words, if you go to a system where you have to follow a certain regulation, that is very important in living a, a life because regulation is the foundation for success in the execution of your goals of life. Srila Prabhupada was highly regulated in his activities. We know that he was so regulated that they could set the clock by his activities. And he followed that very strictly, understanding the principle of but sometimes he had to adjust that due to preaching and traveling. But still, on a personal level, he maintained strong regulation. So the basis of, you know, like some kind of, uh, uh, what the, what's the word? Institutional education, it teaches you regulation. <laughs> Just like if you go to the army or any kind of military service, they also teach you regulation. And you have to do those activities in a regulated way. So that's good because if you don't have that training with becoming regulated, then to systematically understand how bhakti works becomes very difficult. It becomes very difficult. And then what, what's the problem? The mind and the senses jump in anyway, any, at any time and then give their own regulation. But regulation keeps you, allows you to control your mind and senses and move it in a certain direction, in the, in the desired direction, and that is Krishna consciousness. So, so basically, um, but, but what we learn in these institutions, which they call educational institutions, is really um, how to exploit other people. <laughs> it's, it's really what it is. Because if you have the ideas to, to be better than someone, so there's all competition in materialistic life, especially in educational institutions, to be better than somebody, uh, to be in control of others. But in spiritual life, a devotee wants to be lesser than everyone in the sense that they want to serve everyone. They don't think, oh, I have to be better than this person. They're not comparing themselves with this between this person and that person. This idea of comparing is a big, big thing in materialistic life. People like to compare themselves to people who are lower, and then they feel better, and compare themselves to people that are higher, then they feel envious, you know. <laughs> this is how material life goes on. So that's what material education does. It puts you in a certain social and economic position where you're always comparing and either feeling uh, falsely happy or always envious. <laughs> And then you struggle to somehow or other maintain your position and further that position. And so this is, this is that knowledge you get. So, and as, you know, Prahlad Maharaj was asked, you know, what did you learn in school? You know, he just basically explained that what I learned, and I didn't learn anything in school. <laughs> I learned from my real teacher, you know, who has complete knowledge. There's a discussion in London with one mother of one uh, devotee of Prabhupada who joined in London. And she's nice. She likes the fact that her son is now a devotee. And she's talking to Prabhupada. You have to hear this lecture, a discussion. She's very prim and proper and she speaks so nicely. But it's one thing she can't get through her head. Why is... is Prabhupada not allowing kids to finish their education. She says, you are so intelligent and you were educated, but now, you know, my son 
it's nice he's a devotee. I can see he has so many, you know, good, good behavior now. But he's going to be stupid. He's not going to go to school. And Prabhupada's coming from one side, coming from another, trying to somehow convince her that this materialistic education is not required to, to achieve happiness in life. You can be happy without it. In fact, you can only be happy without it. And she can't get it. It's a long distance. She can't get it through the whole talk. I can't see why my son doesn't go to school. You're not allowing them to finish. You know? She's practically you know, begging Prabhupada to be different. But Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he gives the whole thing. It's, he says the, the educational systems are slaughterhouses. They destroy the good qualities of the living beings. If you learn a technical skill, I mean, that's something you may be able to use. But the stuff you learn in terms of the knowledge they teach you, you know, it's, it's practically, it's extraneous to anything in life, you know. And it's just useless, just useless knowledge. You know. How many people are in China? Who cares, you know? <laughs> so, you know, why, you know, George Washington, you know, he died of syphilis, you know, so you know, he's considered a decent, you know. So you learn about, you know, the, the lives of degraded people. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's one thing after another. So, so and you can see, they just, they just did a recent survey, and of course they're doing this survey regularly. Uh, how do students value and view their life in colleges? And I was shown a statistic, and nine out of the ten of them all had negative uh, attitudes towards school. They didn't like it. They did it because, you know, they felt it was like, okay, there's some value to it. I can get a job, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so we see one thing after another. And a lot of times you go to school, you get an education when you come out. Nobody wants to hire you anyway because whatever you know is useless. <laughs> so even from the material point of view, there's nothing when we say substantial in material education. It's just it's a it's a waste of time. <laughs> it's a waste of time. Because you know, one who actually has knowledge, you know, Prabhupada tells the story of the uh, of the uh, boatman and the scholar. You've heard that story? No. <laughs> <My rest. laughs> okay. I'm glad you're honest. <laughs> so this this is an interesting little antidote, which kind of gives us a little understanding. So one scholar, and he has many, 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 you know, what do we say, educational carriers. He's well versed in so many fields of knowledge. So he goes to India and he's in India and he comes to the banks of a river and he wants to cross. So he realizes he needs a boat so that he calls the boatman and the boatman comes. You know, he's just a simple guy wearing his little, you know, gumsha. Probably has holes in it. He moves his boat over and the scholar gets in and wants to go across. So while they're crossing, the scholar's looking at this this, you know, boatman. He's thinking, this person doesn't know much. So, he's, so he decides to get into a little conversation. So he says, you know, Mr. Boatman, you know, you're a boatman here. Do you know the science of oceanography? The displacement of water, you know. <laughs> so he said, what is that word? <laughs> he said, I don't know anything. I just roll my boat, that's all. <laughs> And the scholar said, well, you know, 50% of your life is wasted. <laughs> that was his reaction. So then after a while, he's, he's still crossing, and he says, you know, here you are, sometimes you're at night, and you see the sky, and you see all these stars. You know the science of astronomy? You say, what is that? <laughs> you, know, how st you know, how stars and the constellations, and he describes the cosmos, all the things. And the boatman says, I don't know, I just rode my boat. <laughs> so after some time, 
uh, there seems to be a storm brewing. So the brew of storm comes and it's raining and then all of a sudden the waves of the ocean start, you know, become turbulent. And the boat is rocking this way and that way. And it's really becoming a life and death experience. So finally, uh, the scholar, he's, he's for afraid for his life. So the boatman says to him, uh, Mr. Scholar, do you know how to swim? <laughs> he says, no. He said, 100% of your life is wasted. <laughs> so, yeah. These are, you know, little antidotes to help us understand that materialistic knowledge, it just makes you arrogant and proud, you know. And, but spiritual knowledge is, the basis of spiritual knowledge is really humility. Because spiritual knowledge doesn't come by way of reading books or learning verses. Spiritual knowledge comes by way of the mercy of Krishna through his representative, the pure devotee. And when the pure devotee is pleased by the effort of the devotee to execute Krishna consciousness, then, yasya prasadam, bhagavat prasadam, then the path to devotional service is wide open. And one receives automatically, what we say, features of transcendental knowledge, sometimes in a realized way and sometimes in a theoretical way. But in any case, one receives knowledge by the mercy of the spiritual master. So one who, so real knowledge, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, is trinata pi suni chena, tayori vasa hishnina, mamani na mamana de na kirtini yasa. When one is actually cultivating the qualities of a Vaishnava, then knowledge becomes, what we say, understood easily. So it's a matter of developing spiritual qualities in, in relationship to the practice of devotional service. And of course, we learn different things in the scriptures, and we can, we can consider that. But that's theoretical. It only becomes realized when we execute devotional service in a way that pleases the spiritual master and the Lord. And then that knowledge becomes what is called Gyan and Vigyan. And Prabhupada explains the difference. Vishishtagan, again, or, yeah, Vishishtagan means that that knowledge which is intensification of theory comes to the point of what we say realization. And I'll give you a little formula for those who like to read and study. Because reading and study goes through five stages. When you reach the fifth stage, you actually benefit from your reading and study. The first is you read, and the second is you try to understand. And then through understanding, you, 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 you do apply application. In other words, you take that knowledge and apply it in your day-to-day -day life as you perform devotional service. Practical application of knowledge brings Vigyan realization. And what is realization? Brings qualities and devotion. One develops skills, one develops qualities, one develops character, good character and devotion. These are the, these are the results of knowledge. The knowledge goes through different stages. Transcendental knowledge, that is. But material knowledge, what is it? You get some diploma, you don't even remember half the stuff they taught you. And then you look for a job and you go to the door. You knock on the door and say, Mr. Dog, Mr. Mr. Employer, I'm your dog. You wag his tail. Do you have any, any, any place for me to sit and bark? And if he doesn't, then he says, go away, dog. And then you go to the next master, a potential master. So you're like a beggar going from door. That's why it says a Brahmin will never accept employment in the material world. He'd rather beg or not even starve than to accept materialistic employment just to maintain himself. I know one devotee, now you guys are going to be shocked with this and I'm going to be criticized for this thing. Anyway, I'll say it. I know one spiritual master, 
He doesn't give Brahminical initiation to anybody who has an outside job. I mean, that's a little extreme, but this is why, because he says Brahmins should not work. Brahmins should not work for materialistic people. And that's actually Shastra. But of course, because we haven't developed, you know, Van Ashram yet, still devotees are going outside in order to maintain themselves, sending their kids to Karmi school so they can be destroyed. <laughs> like in some countries, I don't know here, but I think because of the former communist regime here, that people are required to send their children to schools, right? It's a law. But in countries like America and others, you can do homeschooling, where you can keep your children. Huh? Here, you can do it here. Oh, you're homeschooled. That's why they're, they're sitting in class listening to Bhagavad <laughs> If they weren't homeschooling, they'd be out, you know, playing frisbee somewhere else. <laughs> this is their school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that is actually a way to educate. And then, of course, when one gets to the level for higher education, they can also accept that. Well, of course, we don't recommend it, but it's being done. But that's the whole thing, that because of our society hasn't really come to the point of really developing Divine Ashram as Prabhupada wanted it, we're still looking outside for both employment and for education of our, our children. And that's a big problem, not a small problem. It's a big problem. But Prahlad Maharaj, he's five years old. Of course, he's a, he's a self-realized soul at five. And he doesn't have to, he doesn't want anything to do with that knowledge that is not related to the process of devotional service. Okay, so thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Modern education, spiritual education. Everybody's looking towards everybody else to ask a question. What are they doing doing exercise? Huh? They're doing stretching. Stretching? Uh -huh. I exercise, huh? <laughs> Any comments? Ananta. Hare Krishna. <clears throat> you mentioned that Brahmana was not employed for materialists, but we can see even in this story here, Shananda and Amarka, Amarka mm. they were employed in Hiranyakashipu's school. They were different kind of Brahmins. They were, they were not, <laughs> they're not Vaishnava Brahmins. <laughs> well, yeah, even a, even a, a non-Vaishnava Brahmin who is actually cultured and education of Brahminical you know, teachings, usually, because it says in the seventh canto, and later on you'll see, that if there's nothing to eat, they'll even go to the fields and look for grains in order to pick it up and then cook some grains. They won't take any, any work. Like that. That's a real Brahmana. That's a real Brahmana. But we don't have that nowadays. But, yeah. Because they just won't take employment from any anything in this system. They, they work only under the guidance of religious principles, not economic principles. Yeah, but these are sons of Sukaracharya, and Sukaracharya was a seminal guru. He was a paid Brahmana. He was getting a lot of his uh, support from Bali Maharaj. And that's how he was being maintained. That's why he was disturbed when ba when Vamana Dev came in, and Bali was going to, you know, give Vamana Dev, who Sukaracharya could understand, was going to take everything away. So he was worried about, you know, his share. He wasn't going to get his share anymore. So he was paid. He was a paid Brahmana. So there are different levels of Brahmins. 
Well, you, well, I guess they say, I mean, they give him credit for being a Brahmana here, but like Brahma Bandhu, huh? <laughs> Maybe also one comment on modern education. Mm. Uh, I went through the slaughterhouse. I mean, I was educational system up to the highest level. I mean, after the PhD, and majority of things I don't use, of course. And but one thing which I learned, which I also uh, found that is uh, useful, is methodologies which I learned there. Yeah. You know, how to study, I studied there. Yeah. So I'm studying Shastra through that kind of skills. That's what I was saying. Yeah. How to become regulated in even in in organizing your life and learning. That's a that's a form of regulation. Yeah. And there are many skills which have that taught mm, yeah. also for them in the leadership or which are very useful. You know, for example, team building right. skills, which is very useful, even amongst the office. No, we need team building because we don't have people who, who want to follow anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to create a team. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just pay. So really, I mean, it, Prabhupada gave the formula for, for organization. It doesn't work because nobody wants to follow the leader, so we have to have a team. It's like we run the temple by a board of directors instead of a temple president in a lot of places around. Yeah. And that, that wasn't Prabhupada's program. He had temple vice president, you know, temple commander, financial, uh, what do you call it, accountant, all these things. Simple. Yeah, governing, yeah, yeah, governing board commission, yeah. Well, that that's a managerial situation also, yeah. But when Gorgo Maharaj came on the board, he wanted everybody to listen to him, <laughs> and no, nobody wanted to follow that because <laughs> he un understood, you know. According to spiritual position, everyone should follow. But, you know, that's why things are so complicated. Instead of following people who are self-realized, we follow people who are good at managing skills. <coughs> and that's, that's one of the problems. Well, you need both, you know. Like that. But, as it says, Prabhupada says, when you know Krishna, you know, you know everything. For those who are self-realized or pure devotees or who are advanced in Krishna consciousness, can, they know how to manage, but they don't do it. That's not, that's not their service. That's not, uh, yes. Well, we have the example of Shivananda Sain and uh, Vasudev Dot. That Vasudev Dot was not very good at handling his finances. So Lord Chaitanya told Shivananda Sain to look after him, otherwise He's so generous, he's giving away all his money, and he, he can't support his family. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's not necessarily that one is, has some spiritual knowledge or realization. We don't need a board of directors to, to tell somebody, to or help organize somebody's personal affairs. That's the point. <laughs> I mean, anybody can give advice. It was, a, it was advice that, that Lord Chaitanya gave. But what was his advice? That, you know, he's a great soul, but he can't function on the material level. So somebody can do it for him. Yeah, for the, other, the other thing is that our Krishna consciousness movement is not material; it's a spiritual movement. Right. So even managing in our movement is not material management; it's a spiritual management. Exactly. So spiritual management, as opposed to material management. It's not about getting the job done. It's about elevating the people that are, your work, that are working under you at the same time getting the job done. Well, you have to, yeah, you, in material management means what? If somebody's not up to the standard, 
in material society, they can, you can give them a chance to improve, and if they don't, they just replace them. But we don't replace devotees because we value each and every person. So to manage in material, a spiritual society all means man help to manage that person's spiritual life, along with managing the uh, the day-to-day -day functions of the temple and the village. That's why it's so difficult to speak for spiritual management. You have to consider the person too and his benefit. That's why Prabhupada said we need this Vanashram Dharma. And he writes in the first canto, the spiritual master should be able to observe his followers and see how best that he can engage them in Krishna consciousness. In other words, see their nature and then organize that where they can become productive and happy in their execution of devotional service. But that was one of the problems in our society is that we, it wasn't so much about the devotee, it was about the system. And we just used devotees. We still do that. Well, you not got nothing to do, all right, we need you over here. <laughs> I remember when I had to, when I was working with new people in one temple that I was staying at, uh, we had one person who was the, the, the you know, guy who fixed everything. So, you know, when he, I was working with these new people trying to educate them, and he would come up to them and ask them, hey, I need you to help me carry this, you know, <laughs> or do this, or do that, or do this, you know. And, and, and it would make it difficult for me to really bring these people along in the proper way. Because he would just be trying to pull people away to, to help him with his day-to-day, -day, you know, services. And they weren't getting what they could have got in the right way, as opposed to, you know. Once in a while I would let them go, but then a lot of times, you know, you know, they were just being, they, in other words, they weren't being used in the, in the way that they could actually advance in Krishna consciousness. So that's one of the problems that we face, just giving people service and not knowing how to engage them. We put the service before the person, but we see now when you put this person before the service, the services get done eventually. It's more about the devotee and not about the service. But the, you know, because if you take care of the devotees, the devotees will take care of the service. So that's a system of observation, evaluation, understanding, and engaging people accordingly. And that's still, we have a ways to go with that. Question? Yeah. <coughs> what do you like to do? What is your, what is your favorite service? What do, what do you resonate most with in Krishna consciousness? What service would you like to do? Hmm? I, I, I like to clean. You like to clean? Yes. That's one of the most important mm -hmm. services for temple life, is cleaning. Really. So here you go. Well, who's the manager here? You? Yeah. So there, you can, you can do cleaning for Krishna. And Prabhupada said, when you clean the temple, you clean your heart heart is also synonymous with the temple. So yeah, so we need you to do some cleaning. Would you like some service? You need some cleaning? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. okay, um, there we go. Well, I mean, I know you have uh, quite high standards of cleanliness. Uh, well, when you say <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure I can, well, you can I'm do up to the we do you do your best. It's not like we criticize you because you're not up to the standard. <laughs> if you're trying to serve and you're trying to clean, you can also learn to clean. Prabhupada taught us how to clean. I, I'm, t I'm teaching uh, Bhakti Vatsala how to wash the floor. He was giving me sticks with a piece of cloth on the end and pushing the dirt from one side of the room to the other. And he was calling that mopping the floor. <laughs> And then I told him, I taught him how Prabhupada did it. <laughs> Prabhupada taught us, you get a bucket, rag with water in it, and you, you 
dip the rag in it, you wash one area, you squeeze out the rag, you squeeze it as dry as you can, then you dry that area, and then you go on to the next area. And when you're done, the floor is completely clean and dry. <laughs> That's Prabhupada. Prabhupada taught us that. <laughs> He's been doing it. You like it now? Yeah, he likes it because it actually works. <laughs> I see people with these mops and here goes the dirt one way and it's going that way. And there it goes that way. We got a little bit on the cloth. 10%, 20 sometimes. But yeah, so there is a way to clean. And if you feel inspired in your service, you think, oh, how can I do my service better? I love to clean. In fact, you know, I, I actually spend a lot of time cleaning and organizing. I just love to do that because it's just my nature. I'm, you know, I like to clean and organize and like to make things, you know. But I can't always have, I, I, I could do that all day and find satisfaction in that, but that's not my service. <laughs> I have to do other services, so, okay. So if you feel inspired and you have some time, please come forward and do some cleaning. And it's really a wonderful service. As Prabhupada said, the person who's distributing books outside and the person who's cleaning the temple, from Krishna's point of view, they're equal. That's what he said. Well, I suppose, but in the cleaning time, what is that for? <laughs> there, there is more effect from my cleaning than from uh, distributing books. I mean, I distribute, but I'm not much of a money collector. <laughs> Well, that's all right. Some people just don't have that acumen. You know, you, whatever, you, whatever you are feeling inspired to do, you can do it for Krishna. It's needed. Okay, you had a question? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, we haven't been probably, because you were mentioning this dialogue with this lady who insisted on her son getting education. Yeah. We, we, I mean, Shri Prabhupada got education. His father was pure devotee. So, uh, and we have a young, intelligent man here who spent all his life in Iskon and thought uh, that it's necessary to get uh, uh, material education. So we should maybe ask him why, why he did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> well, if you're going to work in the world, that's another thing. If you're a grihastha. And but Prabhupada, he didn't even, he was a Gandhian when he was going to college. And so when it came to uh, accepting his diploma, he didn't show up along with many of his uh, you know, peers. They rejected their diploma <laughs> as a protest, although he went to school. <laughs> I mean, it was fashionable. I and mean, we all know, as you grow up, once you enter into Krishna consciousness, then you understand, well, I have at the, my disposal that education and that will bring me complete satisfaction and happiness and the goal of life. So why don't I put my attention and energy in that? That's, you know, that's, you know, practical reasoning. But before, if you're going to school before, finish your education, then come and join the ashram. Mm -hmm. Generally, we don't tell people to quit if they're going, but we tell them to finish, and then once they graduate, they may have their diploma, maybe they can use their education later on in life for some material gain, but that's only for those who are actually entering into Grihastha life. If you're not married, then what's the use of going to school? <laughs> or not planning to get married. Does that help a little? <laughs> but 
tell me what's what about material education that you think is so important? No, I, I mean, I, I was more into some speculation before, but speculation is necessary only until you find what is, until you accept some goal of life, then you should do something about it probably. No? Yeah. This philosophical speculation, it's in fifth uh, chapter of Bhagavad Gita also. That you, don't need, you don't need material education to speculate. <laughs> That's for sure. I mean, there's people in the villages in, in around the world who know the goal of life, but they, they don't even know how to write their name. <laughs> oh, but I said in the Western countries, people don't even know about, you know, that this life is the only life. They think this life is the only life. For a common villager, he knows. That I have to act properly because in my next life, you know, I'll either get rewarded or punished. So they know that, that, this, that there's a difference between the soul and the body. That's the beginning of education, just to know that. So people go to materialistic institutions to learn education, but they don't even know who they are. They still think they're this body. So they haven't even begun to get real education. As Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, you know, materialistication makes, a, makes an ass <laughs> out of an individual. He can speak, he can bray, you know, the ass is braying loudly. <laughs> Something like that. I remember there was one devotee in Slovenia who used to go to his place in the mountains. Slako, I think it was in English. And he had this donkey there. Poor donkey. He was all alone. <laughs> Actually, he gave him a name. I forgot his name. What was the name of the donkey again? Huh? Huh? Ass. <laughs> ass. <laughs> <Bought the> ass. <laughs> Herman. Herman. Herman was his name? It was a Slovenian name, wasn't it? <laughs> Poor name. donkey. Amen. <laughs> I mean, donkeys are, I mean, they're living entities too, so we shouldn't criticize anybody's material body. <laughs> but amongst the animals, they're not really highly placed <laughs> in the animal society. So a don uh, we had two donkeys in uh, New Vrindavan, just across the road from the, from the temple, and we had a big field. And one was a female, one was a male. So one devotee decided to learn a little bit about donkeyology, and you know how, how donkeys do things. I was watching, and this is a fact. You know, the male donkey he sees the female donkey gets all excited, so he's going for you know getting some action. So he's on his way. So when he gets close. She doesn't like the idea, so she kicks him with her hind legs right in the face. And he just moves back a little bit, and he shakes it off, comes up again, thinks now I'll try again, you know. You know. Maybe she just didn't get it right the first time. <laughs> so he goes again, and she whacks him again, even harder. <laughs> and he falls back again. So after going through this for a while, then he finally, then she finally acquiesces and gives in. He doesn't give up, you know. <laughs> he's a little battered, but he's he's still determined. <laughs> so we sometimes we connect this to materialistic, uh, what we say, so-called civilized life. <laughs> People get kicked by the material energy, and they just keep coming back to get the same kick. Maybe if I go around this way, the kick will be not as hard as the previous time. <laughs> but you can guarantee, as soon as you try to enjoy this material world, you're going to get a kick. <laughs> some form or other, there's going to be some kick. It's going to come. It's just the nature of the material energy. So we can learn a little bit from donkeys about what not to do. And Krishna has somehow or other put uh, what we say knowledge, that is what we say practical knowledge, all through life. I mean, just by observing 
in a, what we say, objective way, and having a little bit of understanding, you can start to see how nature is teaching us so many things that is practical and helping us also to move forward towards spiritual life. Yeah, nature is a great teacher. Yeah, so yeah. Okay, so we'll stop here. Okay, should I end with a nice song? I have a nice song. Should I end? Would you like to hear a nice song? Okay, this is all about school. Okay, ready? This is a rock and roll song back in the 60s. Okay. No more books and studies, and I can stay out late with my buddies. I can do the things that I want to do, because all my exams are through. I can root from the root from the root for the Yankees from the bleachers, mm -hmm. and I don't have to worry about teachers. I'm so glad that school is out. I can sing and shout. You like that? It's a nice mantra. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Huh? Who's school is out. You remember that song? He knows all the rock and roll songs. <laughs> he was telling me about the other ones. <laughs> so, yeah, I learned that one when I was a kid. I haven't forgot it yet. Because it used to be one of my mantras. <laughs> so, yeah, I never liked school. I think the highest grade I ever got in school was a C minus. <laughs> one time they accidentally gave me a B and then they realized they made a mistake. <laughs> My, part, my report card had a lot of red marks on it. Because <laughs> they used to, if you got an F, failure, they'd put that one in red so you'd see it, you know. <laughs> so my average, my average grade was D plus. So, you know, that's a, <laughs> that means dunce plus. <laughs> I never liked school. I hated it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sheila Prabhupada Ki Jai.